Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. It's that time of year when our resolutions to change our ways and become better people are beginning to waver. But were we always fooling ourselves about how much freedom we have to change our characters? The neuroscientist Dick Swab argues that much of our destiny in life has already been fixed at birth or even before it. He's here to talk about his book, We Are Our Brains. We are our stomachs too, according to the philosopher Julian Bagini, whose latest book, The Virtues of the Table, offers recipes for reflective self-improvement and apple and blackberry crumble, among other dishes. Theatre director Natalie Abrahami is just about to open a new production of Beckett's great tragic comedy of resilience and self-reliance, Happy Days, and Helen Dunmore's latest novel, The Lie, is about a former soldier returning from the First World War. I don't think Michael Gove's going to like it. Uh, we'll come back to why later. Uh, but we're going to start uh, with Dick Swab, whose uh, working life has been dedicated to the organ, which allows us to think about all this stuff in the first place, uh, the brain. Uh, Dick, you use a very intriguing phrase in your book, neuro-Calvinism. Yeah. Are you a neuro-Calvinist? And, and can you explain to listeners what a neuro-Calvinist is? Yes, that's how I called myself, is a smile on my face. But... Uh, in a way, it, it's it's true. It's essentially about predestination that you yes, you yes. take the view that so a lot of our um, behavior can be explained by the fact that uh, we are programmed, programmed by our genetic background and uh, by the early developmental process of the brain, and this uh, makes the structure of the brain and how we react to the outside world later. So. To give an example, 88% of our IQ is determined by our parents. So it's extremely important to choose your parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in, in addition, our sexual orientation, our gender identity has been uh, programmed before birth. And uh, all our talents, but also our limitations, are determined by the structure of our brain. And this is what I call neuro-Calvinism. Um, that has some significant kind of political consequences, doesn't it, in both directions? If you say that your sexuality is determined before birth, then then you you drive towards a liberal view of sexuality. But at the same time, if you say your IQ is determined before birth, you might undermine notions that the way a society is organised ought to be organised so that, that everybody gets an equal chance. I mean, it, it's a complicated affair, isn't it? Well... We should have an equal chance, but we are not equal. And uh, we certainly have not all the uh, um, potencies that are comparable from the moment of uh, conception. So we should, um, uh, we should know that uh, there are limitations to this uh, possibility of educate people, let them grow. Uh, some people just have bad luck by the genetic background and by the way they grow up, and we should take care of them uh, as a society. Um, you write very interestingly about the self and, and self-consciousness, and, and one of the ways in which your book operates is by the moments at which the brain goes wrong, uh, which offer a kind of window into its workings. Uh, just talk about body integrity identity disorder. I was absolutely mm. fascinated by that. Uh, just just explain what it is, first of all. Yeah, those are people who are perfectly healthy, but they are convinced from uh, very early onwards that, for instance, the, the lower part of the right leg doesn't belong to them, although it's functioning perfectly well. And apparently the body scheme in the brain has not been developed properly. And they do anything you can imagine to get rid of that healthy part of the brain. And they only feel... Health, healthy part of the body. It's not, uh, well, it, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, a healthy <laughs> part of the body. And they, they feel, uh, as they say, complete when they uh, get rid of this part of the, bra of the, uh, of the body. So it's, it's amazing that uh, apparently the, the, the body scheme is programmed in the wrong way, and therefore they feel that this part doesn't belong to them. So what are the Im implications of that finding for how our consciousness works, or how our sense of self works? Well, we, we work for a main part unconsciously. And to give you an example, one of the important decisions we make is partner choice. 
And we make that not by uh, putting uh, in a row the advantages and disadvantages of uh, a possible partner, but we fall in love. And this is an unconscious uh, process. But it's certainly uh, taken into account uh, uh, all the advantages and, and disadvantages you know of the possible partner. So, in a way, the brain is uh, working unconscious, uh, but um, uh, very efficient. And, uh, well, quite often uh, the choice, the partner choice is uh, right. Um, we like to think that we make the decisions in our life, mm. apart from force majeure or being forced to do something yeah. or having to get a job. Um, in Your book seems to suggest we're, that's a, something of an illusion. We kid ourselves a little bit about how many decisions we make. Yeah, it's a very nice dis- illusion. It's uh, nice to feel that you are in power of your own decisions. But all the experiments show that uh, the decisions are made unconscious and only after between half a second and seven seconds uh, the decisions become conscious. So is consciousness then something like the minutes of a meeting? Uh, The debate has taken place, the decision has been made at some stage and then it's written up. And it's only when it's written up that we come to the idea that we have made that's a very good uh, comparison yes also because it has some mistakes in it (laughs) (laughs) well this is the other uh, uh, the other interesting uh, facet of your book is you're you're um, you're not very uh, uh, convinced about the accuracy of memory and memory is is fluid and uh, and essentially a narrative so not only consciousness but also memory yeah, we are, we are putting uh, different parts of the memory in different places of the brain. If we memorize, then we have to bring it together. And we make a nice story of the fragments we find. So you can swear in front of the judge that you are telling the truth and somebody else can uh, give a different story with the same, uh, sto- with the same uh, swearing. So it, it, uh, memory uh, cannot be trusted, no. Um, I want to bring Judy and Virginia in soon, but I just want to ask you one last question before I do. Um, Consciousness is obviously a necessary condition of life. What is self-consciousness for? Because that is not. You can have an amoeba. Amoeba doesn't wander around thinking, what's it all for? How do you know? (laughs) Well, we don't know, but I think it's unlikely, don't you? (laughs) But uh, what does self-consciousness deliver to an organism that, uh, that mere consciousness doesn't? Well, we we are social animals. We have to live in a society. So we should uh, distinguish self from the other, which is very important, of course, uh, in order to find your place in society, not to make ma- too many mistakes. Um, Julian Bergini, you, um, you write about neuroscience in your book and, and the limits to which it can explain away things such as free will and self-consciousness. Yeah, well, I'm not entirely sure how much neuroscience really changes our understanding of free will. I think the fundamental idea, which predates this modern research, is that you know, our brains are basically the things which allow us to think and that a lot of what we do is unconscious. Now, neuroscience has done a lot, I think, to explain more about this and show that we're perhaps things that more that is going on that we don't understand than we thought but the fundamental idea of free will which you're saying doesn't exist is that you know free will ought to be this ability to act unconstrained by internal or external constraints and that just seems to me an unrealistic idea if if that's what we thought free will is then no one should ever think we have it i can't even really properly make sense of what it would mean for me to make a decision which wasn't in some way constrained by my nature and my experience and so forth. So, I mean, so when you say free will is an illusion, I'd like to say, well, there's an idea, of, a naive idea of free will is an illusion. But even you surely think that there is something else we do have. Because, for example, you talk about development and you think it's important to treat people differently when they're children, when they're between ages of 16 and 24 and when they're adults. And the reason for that is that as we grow older, we do develop the ability to monitor and control and adjust our own behaviour. Now, isn't something like that a more realistic mm-hmm. idea of free will that we, we might have? Well, that, that's called free won't, isn't it? <laughs> Just the inhibition of the impulses. That is uh, the idea. Uh, but free won't has also been studied by experiments now. And uh, again, the same story shows up that we make the decision to inhibit the impulses in an uh, unconscious way and only later we become conscious of it. So I I don't think that uh, this... uh, this definition of free will but is that not uh, just an changing ac- the idea is that not just an accident of timing 
uh, that, as it were, the the last task the brain does mm-hmm. is to is to marshal the the self conscious awareness of a decision mm-hmm. made. It doesn't mean that you haven't made that decision. No, of course not. The brain is making the decision, and we are our brain. But, but so. you're, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's the point. If we are our brains, then uh, some people. I'm not saying you say this, but a lot of people get scared by the neuroscience because they think, oh. It's not me, it's my brain. But as you say, yeah. we are our brains. Yeah. So yeah. if it's yeah. our brains are doing these things, even if it's unconscious, it's still us. And what really matters for free will is the extent to which our actions are things we can change over time. And also that we do things for reasons. Because I think, again, it's not just because of things happening in the brain. If you, will, if you answer my question now, there's a reason for that. Namely, you've heard something I've said. All the, these kind of normal things we take for granted, they're, they're not eliminated by neuroscience. There's still meaning to com- well, they're, conversation. They're, uh, this is, I just want to bring <laughs> Helen Dunmore in before you... Yeah. I, I like your statement, we are our brains, but we are also our bodies, we're embodied selves. Mm. And I wouldn't myself make a distinction between the unconscious and the conscious, as if the conscious is the superior and dominant part of that, because the unconscious, it's constantly feeding our understanding, just as our sens- senses and our touch and our smell may feed our choice of a partner. I, I feel that separating things we are our brain as if our brain is something separate and objective can be um, a little bit perhaps a little bit cold and and not take into account this wholeness of the self well you you mentioned uh, touch which is of course part of uh, brain function senses uh, part of brain function and you can remove many body parts and you're still the same person you can transplant hearts you can transplant lungs and you're the same person but you can make a small lesion in the brain and you're a totally different person so there's a difference between body and brain in that sense um, Natalie Abraham, I um, just want to bring you in. I was thinking of Beckett. He is the foremost um, kind of playwright of neurological distress, isn't he? It's almost impossible now, after the developments in neurology, not to look at those plays and think, oh, this is locked-in syndrome. This is this is Alzheimer's. This is. Uh... It is really fascinating, I think, in terms of looking looking at his plays. You know, thinking he wrote this play in the early in the early sixties when you're talking about different ways in which we saw our brains in terms of social engineering and things like that. And now we're sort of, I think that's a mark of a great play in a way that you know it can feel so prescient in terms of climate change or in terms of the developments in in neuroscience 50 years on and I think it is really interesting particularly when you look at the character of Winnie in, in act one at, um, in this Happy is in Days. Happy Days yeah. yes and then and then in and then in act two in terms of her she's very very locked into essentially you know she's and she well, has literally she's buried up to her waist exactly she? and you have certain she has certain things that she can call upon be it be it memory um in the way that you describe it in the book or be it kind of the poetry and the different things that she's read in her life that kind of become the things that give her real sucker in the way that they give daniel sucker in in helen's in helen's novel and this idea that in the first in the first half of the play she has certain items that are rituals that take us through a day be they be they prayers or be they items that you can sort of use to get you through the day i was i really enjoyed reading the way you were talking about keeping the rising tide of your inbox at bay and in a way I think that idea Julian of of what Beckett has placed in the stage you know what we're putting on centre stage at the Young Vic in, in the round is this metaphor of the human condition and different things in which we are locked in and it doesn't necessarily need to be a neurological or biological situation that we can be trapped. Well I'm going to, I'm going to move on to um, uh, Julian Bugini now um, you've uh, written this book The Virtues of the Table which sounds as though it's going to be you know how nice food is it's not um, <laughs> It's about, well, it is partly, but, but it's essentially using food and using eating and our attitudes to it as a kind of primer in some basic philosophical concepts, isn't it? And how we can, how we can understand ourselves better through the ways we react to food. Um, the opposite of gut instinct, really, isn't it? It's gut, gut rationalisation <laughs> or something. Well, it's interesting you use the word primer. I, I think it's a little bit more than that because I think that when you think about the good life and human nature in relation to our embodied nature, and food is the most embodied thing we do, then it's not just a way in to some classic philosophical ideals. I think you have to sort of rethink some of those philosophical ideas in that context, because in the history of philosophy, I mean, let's face it, people have been in love with the intellectual part, which has often been imagined to be something which is by unfortunate accident connected to a body. But, you know, really, the more we sort of get away from our bodiliness, the better. And, you know, it's hard to find many great philosophers who have anything too good to say about food. 
And I think the premise of the book, really, is that if you really want to understand what it is to live and what we are, you need to, to really get engaged with our physical nature. And, and our, our relationship to food and eating, I think, is one of the most sort of, like, uh, strongest ways of doing that. What You're about sex? <laughs> <laughs> sex is, That's sex the next book. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's just less to be said about sex, I think. Uh, well, no, there's a lot to be said about sex, but I think that... F I, I, I don't know. I, I, you could do that book. Why don't you try that one next time? <laughs> Um, but uh, Julian, you are at odds with some great philosophers. Um, Kant, who you write about in your book, um, ate cheese sandwiches every day in order to avoid the distraction of having to decide. Wittgenstein famously wasn't mm. remotely interested in what he mm. ate. It was just fuel to him. Mm. Uh, so you're sort of at odds with that um, notion that food is a distraction. No, I think that's right. I mean, if you think about... I mean, first of all, I mean, there are some people for whom food is just fuel and they don't take any pleasure from it, and I don't think those people are wrong. I don't think they should all go out and become greater gourmands. But I think all of us, most people take a lot of pleasure from food, but also it is so tied up with all the other aspects of life. It ties us to our relationship to others, the way we, we eat with each other and, and share with others. It connects us to the environment, the way we grow our food, animals and so forth. How we understand ourselves as physical beings. I mean, one of the things I talk about in the book is my kind of uh, embarrassing and uns ultimately unsuccessful experiments in, in weight loss. But, you know, uh, if, you, if you kind of really reflect on what you're doing, though, when you're losing weight, I think you really do understand better uh, the extent to which you are completely tied up in your physicality. And, as, as Dick would agree, I'm sure, all sorts of things are going on which you can't control. Uh, but nevertheless, you have to kind of try and learn to negotiate that. How do I um, live with my body, not in competition with it, but knowing that I, it's not like my brain is the master of my body, but nor should it be entirely vice versa. Well, this is uh, it's very interesting that you write about this now. Just over the weekend, the Sun was writing about, you know, um, bariatric operations. And there is a peculiar kind of moral... Uh, weight isn't there about weight loss and and how we control ourselves it, particularly now a quick mm. fix under the knife gives many an excuse not to tackle the root cause of their overeating is what the sun said yes that implication that that you are weakened mm. uh, and lacking in will if you well, don't i think it's just something in which i, I think Dick would agree is that I think that we, we want to think we're more in control, that our conscious minds and our conscious willing is more powerful than it is. But in fact I think that the, the paradox here if you like is that in order to actually gain control over ourselves and our bodies we have to fully recognise the kind of things that neuroscience and psychology are teaching us about how much we're not in control. So we have to use that information and go with it. Um, Dick Swab, the, the brain is feeding using hormonal messages, isn't it, to say you must eat now? Or... Well, eating is, of course, uh, tremendously important for survival. And uh, in order to um, uh, um, to encourage this, uh, this, the survival of the species, it's coupled to a reward. So we get a tremendous reward of eating, and it's very difficult to refuse reward. Mm -hmm. For some people, <laughs> so, so uh, um, Julian, you um, fasts are very um, fashionable at the moment. I mean, in terms of kind yeah. of dieting fads, but you write about the fast as a different kind of enterprise, an enterprise of mindfulness, not yes. not of weight loss, not of. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's right, and I think this is one thing where religious traditions. I'm not religious, but I think there are things everyone can learn from religious traditions. And, and one of the things that sort of periodic fasting does, it enables you to, as it were, stand back from your desires and sort of reflect on them. And particularly in this day and age, where you can eat from second to second, and most of us can. I know there's a lot of people who actually are having trouble to afford food. But it's a way of, like, noticing that not just succumbing to desires as they arise, but trying to decide which ones to endorse, which ones not to. And then also, when you do eat, to appreciate things more and be more attentive. So it's a way of breaking that automatic cycle of desire and action so that desire doesn't automatically lead to action. You, you, you make that link for yourself. You decide when one is going to follow from the other. It's one of the things that's happening here that we're reinforcing this, this beautiful illusion of control because you, you um, talk about being humbled by the, the difficulties we have in controlling the one thing that we think we're in control of, which is our, our own body. Um, and maybe that exercise is all about reinforcing this, this beautiful illusion that we, that we actually do something. Helen Dunmore. Yes, I, I thought one of the very interesting things that you were talking about, Julie, and was this discovery of limitations, your, your failures, your embarrassments, your humiliations connected with food, which is very 
funnily described, really, but also not using those limitations as stopping points, mm. but saying, how can I live around, within and through my limitations? In fact, how can I develop my character and my, my, my way of looking at my personality and saying, yes, these are my flaws, these are my difficulties, these are my greeds, these are my desires. And how can I become something slightly different while recognising the reality of that? And I really like this idea of, well, you lose a lot of weight very quickly and then you put it on. And then you have to look at what is happening here within me, within the person? What choices, what will am I exerting? Is this valuable for me? Is it not valuable for me? And I really do like this idea of character and the development of character, standing perhaps against what we are given mm. at the outset. But that weight gain is partly physiological, isn't it? The, the, as it were, the unconscious processes are thinking, oh dear, we're in a time of want, we'd better, we'd better sort of start eating more and, and storing fat more. And oh, oh, so uh, the, the problem is that we have been going up for millions of years in the savannah where there was little food mm. so we didn't develop mechanisms to stop eating because if there was food we should eat and have some reserves made and uh, we are still wrestling with this process. I was very interested by something you said in your book Dick Swab about anorexia which would be I suppose generally considered to be a socially derived disease. Mm. You take the view that it's not at all that it's, um, no. that it's a, a disease of the brain. Yes. Um, uh, why is that? I mean, what's the evidence for that? Well, all these symptoms are symptoms of the hypothalamus. That's a part of the brain that is regulating uh, food and reproduction. And um, uh, the, um, th there is a uh, going up and down of symptoms, which is characteristic for autoimmune processes. It's mainly in women, not in men. And... Uh, Already, if you, if you go back to the moment of labor of those girls who have anorexia nervosa, then there is disturbed labor. And labor is initiated... Do you mean in their birth? In their in birth. Their birth. Mm. And labor is initiated by the brain of the fetus, by the um, sloping down of glucose. There's not enough food for the growing fetus. And apparently the, um, the, the girl couldn't manage glucose levels at that moment and she can't later and she gets an eating disorder. Um, Julian Bugini. I, I think just, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to argue that particular point, but I think one has to be careful. If you dig down deep, you'll always end up at a part of the brain and it's easy to conclude, well, that's it then. But I think there's lots of evidence around things that, they certainly involve things like hypothalamus, but um, they also involve belief. So, for example, how much someone eats will depend upon what they believe about, say, how filling the food is there, how much they have had before, and so forth. So I don't think we can ever get to the situation where you can remove from our explanation of human behaviour, even around eating, things like what people actually believe. Um, Natalie Abrahami, we're going to turn to you now. Happy days. Um, no eating in happy days. <laughs> <I was> right? <laughs> no, it would have been so much more helpful if uh, Samuel Beckett had had a small meal somewhere halfway through. But in a way, I think that's part of the joy in that sense. I, I really love the phrase in, in your book, Julian, about urge surfing, that idea of trying to resist temptation in certain moments. And I think there's different, there's different things that we all need to... Um, survive you know i think the big idea in, in happy days is the amazing it's sort of a, an encomium to the survival of the human spirit in that sense and of course it is difficult to survive without without food and i think helen helen dunwell's book really illustrates that really beautifully but in that sense in a way what what beckett manages to do by abstracting things a little and taking us out of the the reality of the day-to-day -day and you know you know reading the third of britain's eat the same things for lunch i think the joy in a way of watching this play is that what beckett is doing by putting this a new metaphor for the human condition on stages that you could, if you want, go, oh, well, I have nothing to do with that life. I don't recognise that at all. We should we should explain to people who haven't seen the play that um, the the um, lead speaker, Winnie, is buried up to her waist uh, in a large mound. Her husband, Willie, is only just visible. You only see the back of his head and he rises up every now and again. So she's sort of trapped. And then in the second act, the mound rises up to her neck. So it's an advancing... and and terrible condition this in which she is bright cheerful resilient continually going onwards and 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 looking for the the uh, sunshine in life 
And I think that's what's really interesting, you know, read in, in, in Dick's book that, you know, light is so important for positivity in that sense and light therapy. And actually, of all Beckett's plays, this is one that has the most light in it. And she starts, you know, with another heavenly day and hail holy light. And I think uh, what I find so extraordinary about this play is that it is about man's ability to survive. And actually, even in moments of real, real... Um, depression and low points actually I think I believe that there is an element of free will about how you respond to a situation so I was reading your definitions of free will in terms of you know it has to be something of your own volition and it has to be something that you can choose to do and actually Winnie's response to this situation I don't know how well I would respond to that situation but she responds very positively and finds the way in which to go on and I think that is something about the evolutionary advantage of man finding positive Spins on you get, yes, you, I, I mean, it's, it might also be a tragedy of somebody who is who, who's fooling themselves. And, you know, it's wretchedly sad, it seems to me, as well, the play, as well as being very funny. Helen Dunmore, you want to say something? Well, the first time I saw Happy Days, I remember feeling quite shocked, chastened, almost frightened by Winnie's situation, the glaring light, the face looking at you, the, the smile which can become a rictus. And I was probably quite young then. But now, reading the play... I find it deeply moving because of the, the persistence of Winnie and all these fragments of her life which are falling away from her. She's like a, a tree with all the leaves falling away. She has a handbag, doesn't she? she has out her of which handbag, she pulls her as, as indeed we all do. She has a handbag and even that in the end. And she has a revolver, which I think they call brownie, don't they? Very tenderly <laughs> talking about this revolver. She does not shoot herself. So I find it a marvellous play. And what it says, particularly about uh, about women's existence, um, the human condition, of course, but this existence of the woman, she's always thinking about her husband who's out of sight. How are you? Are you all right? Have you crawled backwards in the correct way? It's a wonderful, very challenging, very frightening play. I, I think Deborah Warner, another director of this play, said it was the greatest one-woman play ever written. Uh, do you think Beckett writes particularly well for women? I think he does. I mean, I remember he, he famously, you know, would say in rehearsals, he's so trying to abstract the concept, take something from quite a practical place and then tries to abstract it. And so famously actors would ask him in rehearsals, what does this mean? He would say, tis of no consequence. And the way that's the conversation we're having but about free will. But but then, you know, he did let slip in conversation one day when it was being um, put on at the Royal Court in rehearsals. He did let slip that he was trying to think about what is the worst thing that he could imagine. And he was thinking, you know, you would be there isolated. He, you'd be there isolated on your own with only a certain amount of things to get you through your day or your existence. And who could get through this ordeal with this bright light glaring at you and go down singing? And he thought, only a woman. So I do think that he he sort of is in, incredibly um, in admiration of women. Um, you're working with his notes, aren't, aren't you, from a previous production. Uh, what's that like? How detailed are they and how specific? Because his stage directions are immensely specific in the play. Well, what's really wonderful about working with um, his production notebooks, which are from James Nelson, Nelson has kind of got um, a transcript of them, and James Nelson is is Beckett's biographer, is that Beckett himself wrote the play in, in 1960, and then Anne, Alan Schneider directed it in America, and so then when Beckett himself came to direct in 1979, he's sort of like a director going back to his own work, trying to do the analysis that I might try and do about a play. So it's wonderful if you think about the idea that these notebooks still exist. I really enjoyed the metaphor in your book about how in each generation we use the way to describe our most... Um, advanced um, technological machine to describe our brain. So, you know, in the 16th century, the brain was a theatre and nowadays our brain is is a computer. And, you know, talking to Juliet Stevenson, who's taking on the role of Winnie, it's such an amazing learn in that sense in terms of mind mapping this this character's um, speeches. And she was saying, I just need to download more megabytes. I need to kind of be able to kind of <laughs> learn more, you know, find more. And I think it's interesting that we always use use those analogies. And so in in that sense, I think it's really interesting to think about how... Winnie needs to find a way through the through the play, and I think that that's what Beckett is sort of doing in terms of that analogy. Were there any surprises when you were reading his notes or Sam that you went, "Goodness me, I didn't expect that." In terms of Samuel Beckett's notes, I think that what I what I really enjoyed is finding that he he works so hard. I think to do this process of vagening, you know, you see in all his notes that I've got from various manuscripts from Ohio and from Reading, where he'd go, "Oh, you know, actually there was a nuclear apocalypse in in one of the." 
one of the newspaper reports that Willie reads out and you think, oh, well, he's writing this in the 1960s, that's the missile crisis, this is really apt. But then he writes in the, in the margins to Vagan and he takes that out so it becomes a more abstract To Vagan world. meaning to make more vague. To make vague. more vague. It's a, a neologism that you know, he <laughs> made. To make more vague, that, is his, that his, is his route through. So actually I found looking at some of the things that he took out very interesting in terms of finding greater depths for the characterization. There's a very poignant... Um, um, attitude to memory in the play, isn't there? Uh, at the beginning, Winnie is constantly searching after lines of poetry. She can never quite get them. They always mm -hmm. elude her grasp. And then finally, she's able to sing a song all the way through. Uh, uh, it's about memory too as well, isn't it? And how that's one of the objects that gets you through your day. Yes, and in terms of memory, I thought it was so fascinating in terms of um, the Alzheimer's section in your book, Dick, in terms of the last, you know, the way that this idea of first in last in first out in terms of memory so one of the last things that she has when she's sort of up to her neck is her smile which is one of the very first reflexes that we learn as a child and it's really interesting that you know in that analysis of Ronald Reagan that when his Alzheimer's was developing there were more pauses in the way he spoke and the different prepositions went in and out and I think you really notice that in the second act of the play that she really struggles to remember the quotes that came to her more easily but also even to remember certain things that happened in her own relationships so the things that happened much further away in time when she was much younger become more vivid than things that happen more recently and this uh, one thing uh, disappearing later than the smile that's the struggling reflex mm. so if you put a finger in the mouth of an alzheimer patient in the last stage it starts to suckle so it's all the way going back to the and why why is it that um, why is it that music and and song lyrics will stay even in the mind of an alzheimer's patient and right. come and emerge fully formed very basic, uh, even in the womb, a uh, child is memorizing uh, music. So if a pregnant woman is watching a soap with a tune, every day the same tune, the child will recognize the tune uh, after birth. So there's memory of music. And so it's occupying a different section of the brain, is it? That yes. particular kind of memory? It's a different, it's a separate networks, place. Yes. Mm. Uh, it's very important in your novel too, isn't it? You, your character, um, Daniel, has... A brilliant memory. For yes, and, and very different from Winnie's because Winnie, in a sense, has this rag and bone shop of memory with very strong emotional attachment. And Daniel, he hasn't been able to have an education like many people of his generation. He has had to leave school. He has had to get a job. He's got to support his widowed mother. And so he, he's, he's locked out of that educated world, but he has got a phenomenal memory. And his poems become his possessions there's something did you confer that, that upon him as a sort of gift he's he's born with uh, in in dick's terms or is it something he comes up with because he can't have books at home because he mm. needs it it's probably both it's probably a mixture of both but he has got that ear that very acute ear which many poets share with musicians that sensitivity to language and language becomes also it's uh, it's something that rescues him it's his his zone of beauty, safety um, and because he in his life um, he, he, he goes to France, he goes to the trenches and in fact it, it, as he emerges traumatised from that experience we see all these shards and, and rags of memory coming together and he is haunted by the poem The Ancient Mariner The Ancient Mariner who has gone to a far country done something terrible and inexpressible and come home again and cannot reconnect. And I'm thinking about that trauma of the generation who returned, bearing the weight of an experience which was incommunicable. They, they really could not tell those who had not been there what it was like. There was no way of doing that. I should, I, I should explain know. before we go on that uh, why I thought Michael Gove wouldn't like it. And it was only, and not because it's not beautifully written and... Uh, uh, and uh, uh, a wonderful novel, but uh, your epitaph is Kipling's If Any Question Why We Died, Tell Them Because Our Fathers Lied. So you're you're not on the Govian side of this question about the First I'm World I'm not War. really concerned with politicians in the novel. I'm looking at the characters and I'm looking mm. at the experience of the time. Um, and I'm particularly through Daniel looking at this question of, of survival, what survives and what doesn't within you. And interestingly, he adapts very well to life in the trenches. He forms extremely close bonds with the people in his platoon. He succeeds. He understands that rule of trench warfare, which is you may not look after your own feet, 
You may not unwrap your feet, you may not rub them with whale oil, but you will look after the feet of your mate. And he is, for the first time in his life, completely integrated into the group. Mm. But after the war, all that has dissolved, all that has gone. And what is left is the concussion of the things that he has seen and done, and particularly the loss of his closest friend from childhood and guilt, recrimination, doubt. Um, there are two kinds of damage memory he comes back with, aren't there? Because there's, there's essentially he comes back with a knowledge that people at home don't have. I mean, there's a wonderful uh, moment when he walks into the local town and he looks around and it seemed to him that every creature is in disguise. Their skin is a veil to hide the intestines and raw, slimy flesh within. So he's no more illusions. He knows what a human body is made of and how it can be disassembled. But then he also has what we would call, I suppose, post-traumatic shock. Um, he, he has have. visions and mm. uh, unwilling visions of his friend. He has, in the sense, memory has ceased to function in, in, in the normal way for him. Um, the past will not die down. It is alive within him. It is flashing up through him. And he, That's typical for post-traumatic stress yes, syndrome. Yes, it's and paradoxically. It's coming back and back. That's and right. You but can't he, stop it. It's right. But he doesn't want that. He wants to survive. And one thing I wanted to make clear, he has this longing to rebuild a life. He, he gets his little small holding, as many men did after the war. He looks at the seeds that he's going to plant. He notices everything. He wants that green fur of new growth. But, Dick, what you were saying, exactly, it's coming back and back and back. And it's preventing him. It's getting in the way of any possibility of a new life for yeah. him. I was rather interested, I mean, partly because I was reading about free will and thinking about self-control and all of those things. You quote that famous poem, Invictus. I mean, the, mm. the two boys who are friends when they're yeah. young, before the war. I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Um, that's there. I mean, you believe that, do you, as a novelist? <laughs> I think that is used somewhat ironically. <laughs> <laughs> it is part of the baggage of literature that Daniel picks up. Some he keeps, some he discards. And also we're seeing there that he is not going through the typical public school education and formation that his very close friend is going through. So Daniel is like a lot of people who are self-educated. He's aware of the gaps and he's always trying to find things that will be useful for him. Um, so he picks up a poem and sometimes it works and sometimes it isn't good for him. Uh, Julian Virginia. Yeah, I think it's really interesting how we seem to be returning to this theme of we find ourselves within limitations which are often greater than we would hope and uh, often put us in awful situations that we have to cope with them as best we can and find that scope for choice and to make decisions. But I'm, I'm interested as a, as a writer to the extent to which a lot of writers, when they talk about their choices when writing, they, they talk about how their characters tell them what to do, the story pushes them forward. But obviously there, is a, there must be a role for conscious choice as well. So I suppose, how much do you actually feel like you're in control of the process of the writing of a book like this? I try not to think about that too much. I try to synthesise all the layers, the Very unconsciousness, good. the consciousness, <laughs> <laughs> and use everything. I think use everything is what a writer must do. And when I'm writing a character, for example, Daniel, who comes to me very, very strongly, and first of all, I hear the voice, mm. and then I begin to understand the substance, and I will end up knowing far, far more about the characters. I, I love that passage about Beckett. You have to take so much out. Mm. I mean, in some ways, Daniel's experience is quite typical. He's a conscript. He's a young man of his time. He's a young man who inhabits a fracture, a geological fault in history, where everything splits open and the future becomes utterly changed because of that world war cataclysm and yet he is only an individual within that but and i want still, to keep still that. happening every day those those boys who come back from war exactly quite an, uh, let's say 10 15 15 percent have post-traumatic stress syndrome he has mm. another problem daniel doesn't he though because he's on he's on the brink of a class fracture as well the, the, the great change in class and and class mobility which starts to happen after the First World War. It doesn't happen immediately. And that's the tragedy of the book, is that if he could... Well, he, he, needs... come, he, he comes home. I mean, L Lloyd George's um, statement about making a country fit for heroes to live in uh, was a, a, a terrible deception and disappointment to many returning soldiers who came back to unemployment, sometimes to homelessness, like Daniel, mm -hmm. to feeling they had no place. And you have the men selling matches and tea towels on the streets and you have people, amputees, 
struggling for rehabilitation. So it's a very harsh world. It's not the same as after the Second World War. It's a different context. But yes, he has not had an educational opportunity. He's grown up in great poverty. And his longing for life is, is, is so powerful and at every turn by history and by his individual circumstances, his fight is, is a very bitter fight. Um, I liked very much your um, little epigraphs for each chapter, which are taken from the notes for infantry officers on trench yes. warfare. Uh, these, these bureaucratic uh, uh, instructions to officers in the line, completely divorced from the hideous reality of what was happening. Where did those come from? Well, I they mean, come what, from you, those publications. Yeah. They come from those government publications. And they interest me. But that was me. part of your research process, yes. was it? Yeah, and it's very interesting because as human beings, we always try to contain the uncontainable and to make, um, I suppose, make bearable the unbearable, really. And you are looking at something very, very extreme. And yet, you're, as you say, calm, clear, numbered paragraphs telling the young officer, the subaltern, what he's got to do when he's, it, it, when he's sent to serve, when he's fighting. Which, to a certain degree, may have helped, actually, in the sense that if you have a list of things yes. to do, you don't have to... But it's very like Winnie, isn't it, in Happy Days? She has a set of ordered ways in which she gets through the day. And there were so many analogies, I felt, you know, in the way that, you know, um, Daniel talks about the, the Lee Enfield rifle, you know, they, he looks after it like a baby and the ritual of looking after it and the kind of the oiling of it and those things. And actually, it is those rituals that, you know, that, that we that we that do really structure a day. And I thought in terms of when you were talking about the geological fault line in which Daniel inhabits in terms of coming back from the second world um, from the first world war, I think in terms of thinking about happy days at the young at the young Vic, you know, when Beckett wrote, he was writing it for a proscenium arch theatre with a, with a curtain. And and in, in terms of the young Vic, it's in the round. So in terms, we're trying to look at it in terms of climate change and a geological fault and what that means in terms of looking at our lives now and what are we in denial of and saying, oh, this doesn't matter. Do we get to see Willie's face if we're sitting in the right place? If you're sitting in the right place. All right, <laughs> OK. Well, we've run out of time, uh, unfortunately. Thank you to all of my guests. Helen Dunmore's The Lie and Julian Bagini's The Virtues of the Table are out now. Dick Swab's We Are Our Brains is published at the end of the month and Natalie Abrahami's production of Happy Days is on at the Young Vic in London until the 8th of March. Next week, I'll be talking to the composer Sir Peter Maxwell Davis. But for now, thank you and goodbye. There are many more Radio 4 arts and discussion programmes to download for free. Find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio4. Moments at which the brain goes wrong, uh, which offer a kind of window into its workings. Uh, just talk about body integrity identity disorder. I was absolutely mm. fascinated by that. Uh, just, just explain what it is, first of all. Yeah, those are people who are perfectly healthy, but they are convinced from uh, very early onwards that, for instance, the, the lower part of the right leg doesn't belong to them, although it's functioning perfectly well. And apparently the body scheme in the brain has not been developed properly. And they do anything you can imagine to get rid of that healthy part of the brain. And they only feel... Health, healthy part of the body. It's the <laughs> uh, body. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, a healthy <laughs> part of the body. And they, they feel, uh, as they say, complete when they uh, get rid of this part of the, bra of the, uh, of the body. So... It's, it's amazing that uh, apparently the, the, the body scheme is programmed in the wrong way and therefore they feel that this part doesn't belong to them. So what are the Im implications of that finding for how our consciousness works? or how? This is what they call neuro-Calvinism. Um, that has some significant kind of political consequences, doesn't it, in both directions? If you say that your sexuality is determined before birth, then then you you drive towards a liberal view of sexuality. But at the same time, if you say your IQ is determined before birth, you might undermine notions that the way a society is organised ought to be organised so that, that everybody gets an equal chance. I mean, it, it's a complicated affair, isn't it? Well, we should have an equal chance, but we are not equal. And uh, we certainly have not all the uh, um, potencies that are comparable from the moment of uh, conception. So we should, uh, uh, we should know that uh, there are limitations to this uh, possibility of educate people, let them grow. Uh, some people just have bad luck. 
by the genetic background and by the way they grow up, and we should take care of them uh, as a society. Um, you write very interestingly about the self and, and self-consciousness, and, and one of the ways in which your book operates is by the most very intriguing phrase in your book, neuro-Calvinism. Yeah. Are you a neuro-Calvinist, and, and can you explain to listeners what a neuro-Calvinist is? Yes, that's how I called myself, is a smile on my face, but... Uh, in a way, it, it's it's true. It's essentially about predestination that you yes, you yes. take the view that so a lot of our um, behaviour can be explained by the fact that uh, we are programmed, programmed by our genetic background and uh, by the early developmental process of the brain, and this uh, makes the structure of the brain and how we react to the outside world later. So. To give an example, 88% of our IQ is determined by our parents. So it's extremely important to choose your parents. Mm. <laughs> and in, in addition, our sexual orientation, our gender identity has been uh, programmed before birth. And uh, all our talents, but also our limitations, are determined by the structure of our brain. And our sense of self works. Well, we, we work for a main part unconsciously. And to give you an example, one of the important decisions we make is partner choice. And we make that not by uh, putting uh, in a row the advantages and disadvantages of uh, a possible partner, but we fall in love. And this is an unconscious uh, process. But it's certainly uh, taken into account uh, uh, all the advantages and, and disadvantages you know of the possible partner. So, in a way, the brain is uh, working unconscious, uh, but um, uh, very efficient. And, uh, well, quite often uh, the choice, the partner choice is uh, right. Um, we like to think that we make the decisions in our life, mm. apart from force majeure or being forced to do something yeah. or having to get a job. Um, in Your book seems to suggest we're, that's a, something of an illusion. We kid ourselves a little bit about how many decisions we make. Yeah, it's a very nice dis illusion. It's uh, nice to feel that you are in power of your own decisions. But all Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. It's that time of year when our resolutions to change our ways and become better people are beginning to waver. But were we always fooling ourselves about how much freedom we have to change our characters? The neuroscientist Dick Swab argues that much of our destiny in life has already been fixed at birth or even before it. He's here to talk about his book, We Are Our Brains. We are our stomachs too, according to the philosopher Julian Bagini, whose latest book, The Virtues of the Table, offers re recipes for reflecting self-improvement and apple and blackberry crumble, among other dishes. Theatre director Natalie Abrahami is just about to open a new production of Beckett's great tragic comedy of resilience and self-reliance, Happy Days, and Helen Dunmore's latest novel, The Lie, is about a former soldier returning from the First World War. I don't think Michael Gove's going to like it. Uh, we'll come back to why later. Uh, but we're going to start uh, with Dick Swab, whose uh, working life has been dedicated to the organ which allows us to think about all this stuff in the first place, uh, the brain. Uh, Dick, you use...